Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Saturdays for the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Wren. I am your host. Disclaimers, not actually a professor. I don't actually have a PhD and I'm not actually employed by any university. All right, now that that is out of the way, if you have found this video, please make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts or Google Play, please make sure to give us a follow. And if you are listening to us on Apple Podcasts, also give us a five-star review. Now, in today's lecture, roughly speaking, we are going to be discussing a, a bit of an interim period here because we just had the fall of the Western Roman Empire, and now we will be moving on here soon. We're definitely taking a much more Eastern focus here in the show. And we are, we are coming up on Justinian, but I wanted to do a, a little examination here of several emperors between Justinian and the fall of the West in order to kind of set the stage for Justinian's reign and why Justinian was able to do what he did um, because, you know, he ne you know, Justinian needed a very stable empire to take on all of his projects and a, a steady, healthy stream of revenue as well. So we're going to take a look at how all of that came to be. So the first emperor we're going to look at is Leo I. We've talked about him already a decent amount. Uh, Leo reigned from uh, 457 to 747. He was born in Thrace. And Leo, interestingly, he was one of the, he was actually the first Eastern emperor to legislate in Greek rather than in Latin. So before this, the emperors, even in the Eastern Roman Empire, though Greek was kind of the lingua franca, more, more commonly spoken language in the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, the, the imperial business was still done in Latin. However, with Leo, you're going to start to see more of a usage of Greek in the official administrative language of the Eastern Empire and not just as your common everyday, you know, you go to the market, you're talking to people in Greek, you go, uh, you know, go into a school, they're probably speaking Greek to each other. And now we're going to see it moving into more, more official uh, areas as well. Uh, Leo banned non-religious activities, uh, events and celebrations on Sundays, which was somewhat unpopular. I'm, I'd be curious to see if that included chariot races. I'm not sure if chariot races occurred on Sundays or not, but I can definitely see why, you know, they, those were very, very popular. And if that was the case, you know, that would be part of the reason why, um, this would be would have would have been an unpopular decision because chariot races, especially in the city of Constantinople, were a very big deal. Uh, you know, chariot races were like were in the United States like NFL football, or uh, in in Europe, you know, it's like they're like soccer, or I sh I should say, your the the non-American football. And uh, Emperor Leo I is also venerated as a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church, not in the Catholic Church, but in the Eastern Orthodox Church. You can see from his ban of non-religious activity, uh, or I should say events and celebrations on Sundays that uh, his, his faith seemed to be pretty important to him. So it's not, it's, not, it's not very shocking that he is venerated as a saint by the Eastern Orthodox. Now, Leo rose uh, through the military ranks, and he was put on the throne by a guy named Aspar. Aspar was an Alani, uh, wouldn't really say, maybe you could say generalissimo. Uh, he was a magister militum, which essentially, as I've mentioned before, essentially means like master of soldiers. Uh, and because Aspar was Alani, he, uh, of the tribe of the Alans, uh, so not a Germanic speaking people, the Alans, the Alans are an Iranian, uh, speaking people. And so because of this, Aspar does not really have the ability to sit on the imperial throne himself. However, his high ranking, uh, his, his power 
uh, his status uh, makes him kind of a kingmaker in the Eastern Roman Empire. So he can't serve as king himself or emperor, really. Um, but he, uh, uh, if anyone wants to sit on the imperial throne, they basically need Aspar's blessing to go along with that. And Aspar did not think that Leo would be a, a much of a challenge to his to his power and authority. He thought that Leo would be pretty easily controlled, but that was actually not the case. And Leo ultimately does swing power back into uh, his favor, into the favor of the imperial throne, rather than with Aspar, as we will see. Now, uh, another thing about the reign of Leo the first is he was concerned about the, uh, uh, the amount of Germanic Federati soldiers in the army and the overall uh, outsider Gothic influence on the Roman military. Uh, he had issues not just uh, with Aspar, who was a barbarian, not Germanic, but also with Theodric Strabo, who was essentially a warlord for uh, of the Ostrogoths. He's not the only Ostrogothic leader, but he is a very relevant one. Leo does have an uneasy relationship with him. Uh, the Ostrogoths are going to be on and off being settled in Roman land, uh, raiding through Roman land, fighting with the Romans, fighting against the Romans during this time period, as we will see. And so in order to try to uh, decrease Roman dependency on these Gothic soldiers, Leo decides to cultivate relations with a group called the Azarians. Now the Azarians were a bellicose people from South Central Anatolia. Um, I could not find, as I was reaching, researching this, I could not find if the Azarians, the Azar, Azarians, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this. I never really heard of them until I, I started reading about this, but they spoke a, they spoke an Indo-European language, but it's not clear. I was not really able to find if they were like Greek or were they Syro-Phoenician or what exactly their, their ethnic background was, but they were, they were a people who lived up in the mountains of South Central Anatolia. Uh, and so they were, uh, they're pretty, they're pretty, uh, uh, boisterous, pretty rowdy, uh, definitely, you know, uh, uh, don't tread on me kind of types, uh, uh, not always fond of the Roman government, but certainly good fighters. And so this led Leo to cultivate relationships, to cultivate a relationship with this group of people because they're already living within the Roman Empire. They are Roman citizens. They've been a part of the Roman Empire for, I think, I think it was five centuries at this point in time. And if Leo can get the Isarians to uh, join the ranks of the Roman military, that means that uh, uh, he has to depend less on uh, the Goths for, for his soldiers. And so he does, and, and Leo does this, and it does decrease the Romans' uh, dependency on Gothic Federati soldiers. Now, from the Azarians, we get a uh, a very competent general from the from the ranks of the Azarians, and his name was Zeno. He had a different name, um, which I did not write down um, before. Uh, Zeno was kind of a Greek name that he took on to give him more legitimacy in, in imperial circles and this this sort of thing. But he is an Azarian. Uh, Leo was so impressed with him, he gave him uh, a command over an elite unit called the Exubitores, uh, which essentially kind of functioned as like a, a emperor's bodyguard type deal. Uh, but Zeno was a very competent guy and he becomes Leo's right-hand man, so to speak. And Zeno is even going to marry Leo, or sorry, Zeno is going to marry one of Leo's daughters and he will, he will eventually become emperor after Leo's passing. We'll talk about him here in a minute. But Leo and Zeno do manage to snuff out a conspiracy against Leo, which results in the execution of Aspar's son, uh, whose name is not really important. And eventually Aspar will also meet uh, his end. Now, Leo is known also for sending a lot of aid to the Western Roman Empire in its, in its waning days. 
uh, uh, there was the famous uh, Eastern Roman Armada commanded by Leo's uh, brother-in-law, Basiliscus, uh, which was a real, uh, uh, really had egg on his face after that, the, being defeated by the Vandals in 468. However, uh, you know, Leo was not, uh, he was not in command of the fleet. He, he didn't really have anything to do with it other than funding it, sending it off on its way. You know, he, he wasn't really responsible for the defeat at the hands of Geyseric. Now, obviously, you know, when you're the emperor, the buck stops with you and any kind of, uh, when, when your projects don't work out, you are going to get a lot of the blame for it. However, it's not really Leo's fault that things went poorly. We'll say that much. So now we move on to talk about the Emperor Zeno. So as we talked about, Zeno was an Azarian military commander under Leo I. Legend has it that uh, Zeno, even uh, in his younger days, uh, fought against Attila the Hun in 477 as Attila was marching on Constantinople. Now that seems to be maybe an apocryphal story, but it's, it sounds cool. So we'll, you know, you know with a lot of the times when you hear about these interesting you know, stories from history and, so, you know, they've been a legend for a long time. And then people say, well, you know, it's, you know, probably didn't actually happen. And oh, this, that, and the other, and all oh, these, you know, that's cool. That, that story that sounds really cool. Well, that's probably not exactly true. You know, I understand that a lot of, you know, there are plenty of apocryphal stories in history, but, you know, sometimes you just, you just want a, a cool story. You know, you, you want it to be true. You want something like that to be true. Uh, but Zeno will reign as emperor from 476 until 491. Now, Zeno had married Leo I's daughter, Ariadne, and he had a son with her whose name was also Leo. So he was Leo II. And because Leo II was a direct descendant of Leo I, Leo II was actually made emperor after the death of his uh, grandfather, Leo I. However, Leo II was only about seven years old when Leo I dies. And then Leo II is going to die uh, essentially of infant mortality uh, within, I think, I believe it's two years after Leo I's death. And so then Zeno becomes the emperor after the death of his son. And, and Zeno was going to rule his region until his son uh, came of age anyway, so practically speaking, not a whole lot changes other than, of course, the tra you know, tragically losing a child. It's never, it's never a good thing. But Zeno was basically going to exist in the same capacity that he was anyway. He was just not going to have to give up control of the empire when his son uh, came of age. Now, kind of uh, uh, one inter one of the more uh, uh, relevant aspects of Zeno's reign was there was a conspiracy against Zeno by uh, between two guys, Theodric Strabo, who again was an Ostrogothic warlord. I, I I don't know if you can necessarily call him the king of the Ostrogoths because there were a number of kind of subgroups of Ostrogoths at this point in time. Uh, and this conspiracy also involved Zeno's brother-in-law, Basiliscus. You'll remember he was the guy who led the Eastern Roman Armada uh, against the Vandals in 468. And this was fairly soon after the start of, uh, soon after uh, Zeno ascends to the throne. Now this, pot, this plot was short-lived. Zeno did have to flee Constantinople for a while, uh, but Basiliscus in his short time on the throne get, uh, gives command of the, I believe it's the Thracian army to another Azarian named Illus. And Illus, soon after being given command of this army, goes and basically uh, uh, helps out uh, Zeno get back to Constantinople, get back on the throne. So uh, within, within short order, this, this conspiracy and, and Zeno's time away from Constantinople is only about a year, and he does reign for quite a while. Um, and so he is able to thwart that, uh, that threat to his power. Now, Zeno is also going to pull the plug on the Western Roman Empire, as we talked about earlier, when Odeker, uh is, is uh, he, he sends a message to Zeno, basically asking 
to, or, or not really ask, but saying, offering to Zeno, uh, you know, I am going, I can become the new king of Italy and I will uh, pledge my loyalty to you. Uh, you know, you, Zeno, the emperor will have sovereignty over, over Italy, but I, Odeker, will manage the day-to-day -day administration. You know, you won't have to uh, administer this area yourself. And Zeno basically, uh, there, there was, after uh, Romulus Augustulus, there was another guy, uh, uh, Nepo, I think. Uh, his, his name is not supremely important, but I want to say it was like Julius Nepo, uh, who was on the Dalmatian coast. And, and there was some hope that Zeno would back this guy as a claimant to the Western uh, Roman throne. However, uh, Zeno really uh, sees at this point, and really even Leo I understood this, was that after the failure of the 468 Armada, there was no, the, the West was done. It was only a matter of time until the Western Roman Empire fell. And Zeno did not want to dedicate any more resources to this. And so in Zeno's response to Odeker, he basically kind of gives him the wink, wink, nod, nod, like, yeah, depose, depose Romulus Augustulus. Let's, let's just rip the Band-Aid off and be done with this. Now, later on, Zeno is also going to put down a rebellion by his former ally, Illus. Uh, with the help of the Ostrogoths. So this is, it's kind of funny that uh, the Romans at one point here are are recruiting the Azarians to fight, to kind of uh, uh, counterbalance the Ostrogoths. But now uh, the Romans are going to use the Ostrogoths in order to fight Illus and his, you know, I mean, not all of, you know, he's, he's going to have a large component of Azarians in his army because he is Azarian himself. And so with the help of Ostrogothic, uh, Federati, Zeno is going. Zeno puts down Illus, Illus's rebe Illi, the rebellion of Illus. Uh, put down that rebellion. Uh, however, even though the Romans and the Ostrogoths are working together on this one, friendly relationships between the Eastern Roman Empire and the Ostrogoths are going to be short-lived. Surprise, um, and uh, they will they will be raiding throughout Roman territory not too long after this. And uh, uh, I, I believe there's some sort of agreement where there, you know, another one where the, the Theodoric Strabo is given a title and the Ostrogoths are given new land to settle on and this, that, and the other, which is still you know, not much of a, I, I've made my opinion clear about yeah, uh, trying to appease the barbarians at this point in time. I think it's a waste of time. Uh, Zeno also attempted to iron things out between Monophysite Christians and Chalcedonian Christians with the Hen Heno Henoticon. I should have... Anyway, the Henoticon Edict. And basically what the Henoticon Edict was, was sort of a restatement of what was stated at the Council of Chalcedon uh, and when I say that, I mean uh, the confirmation of Christ's full uh, human nature as well as his full divine nature. You remember, if you, you can go back and watch our video on Monophysite Christianity, uh, I believe it's uh, what was uh, mono, mono, monophys, monophysitism explained. Um, but by this point in time, by, by Zeno's reign, a lot of the Monophysites have come around on the idea of, of Jesus's human nature. Um, and the Henetikon uh, edict basically is a way to try to please both sides of the issue. Um, and ever, it seems like a lot of people just kind of grumblingly went along with the edict, although one person definitely did not um, go along with the edict, and that was uh, Pope Felix III, who condemned this, and uh, even though it had the blessing of, of the Patriarch of Constantinople. Now I'm going to read a little bit here from uh, Warren Treadgold's A Concise History of Byzantium. See there. Uh, I've been using this uh, throughout our 
our little lecture series here. Uh, I would recommend, it's definitely very, when it says concise, they definitely mean concise. Uh, uh, in some instances, I would say it might be a little too concise. There is a full, there is a much broader extended version, which I don't know if I've said this on the show before, but I, I emailed, uh, when, when I like first started the series, I emailed a, a link to it to Warren Treadgold, who's a, who's a professor of Byzantine studies at St. Louis University, hoping that he might, you know, listen to the podcast or, or maybe share it with some of his colleagues. And he just basically, I mentioned that I was using his book and he basically sent back to me saying like, oh, did you know that there's an extended version? And that was basically the whole email. And I was like, oh, cool. He didn't, he didn't read it at all. Or he, he didn't listen to the podcast at all. But I, I you know, not salty, not salty. Uh, can't always expect everyone yeah, to uh, uh, listen to uh, everything that's sent to them. Uh, yeah, might happen more than I think. And uh, anyway, certainly no hard feelings towards Warren Dreadcold. And I, I've enjoyed using his book. But anyway, I'm supposed to read out of this. So the wily emperor now conceived, uh, this is regarding uh, uh, this is how this is how Zeno is going to get the Ostrogoths out of his hair. So the wily emperor now conceived of the cleverest of his many schemes for pitting his enemies against each other. In 488, he pursued Theodoric to lead his Ostrogoths into Italy, ostensibly to punish Odoacer for overthrowing the Western Roman Empire. Theodoric ultimately succeeded in conquering. Italy and founding the Ostrogothic kingdom there, but Zeno achieved his real aim of securing Thrace and Eastern Illyricum as soon as the Ostrogoths left Byzantine territory. He enjoyed three years of unaccustomed peace and security before dying of disease in 491. So there you see, this is how, that's basically how um, Zeno solves the Ostrogoth problem. He basically, because again, they're living, they're living in Roman territory, but the Goths never fully assimilate into Roman culture. I mean, you can, you think back to, they first show up at the Roman uh, borders in 376, 375, um, and we're at 488 and they're still not assimilated in the Roman culture at all. So it's just not, just seems like it's not going to happen. It's not going to work out. And so Zeno is basically saying, well, how do I, how do I get these guys out of my hair? And he goes, I know what I can do. I can tell them to go, go into Italy and establish a kingdom there. And then they'll be off of my borderlands. They won't be reigning in my territory anymore. And they'll be, they'll be somebody else's problem. So that's a smart move by Zeno, I would say. Uh, now Treadgold continues. Both Leo I and Zeno had remained in power with great difficulty. Sorry, though, though both Leo and, Zeno, Leo and Zeno had remained in power with great difficulty, they left Byzantium much strengthened. Between them, they reduced the barbarian element in the field armies to a manageable size, while making only a moderate reduction in the total number of soldiers. Zeno finally rid the emperor, empire of the Ostrogoths, giving it, con, giving, con, yeah, giving it control, control over all its Balkan possessions for the first time in more than a century. Despite Leo's losses in his African expedition and many Ostrogothic raids, the treasury remained solvent. So this is important that the empire, the, Rome, the, the Eastern Roman Empire does almost go bankrupt due to the, due to the uh, 468 Armada, but it doesn't, uh, which is very important. Uh, I mean, for obvious reasons. Though without the skill of Leo and Zeno, Byzantium might well have followed the Western Empire into barbarian domination, bankruptcy, and anarchy. Their success also suggests that the Eastern Empire was sustaining its demographic and economic recovery. The two emperors always seemed able to recruit new soldiers and to raise money to pay them, which is very important because if you don't pay the soldiers, they're not going to work as I have said numerous times on this uh, little lecture series here, paying soldiers is very important because people are not going to die for free. Uh, but it, it, is, it is important that both Leo and Zeno uh, 
kind of are, are sort of steady hands of the two. You also, you also notice as well, they're both, they both have longer reigns. They're both, they're both uh, uh, on the throne for, you know, both of them are on the throne for well over a decade, for approaching two decades. Uh, let's see, just looking back at the years here. Yeah, I mean, they both, they both have long reign and long reigns are good. When you have, and especially, and Anastasius as well after them is also going to have a long reign. So when you have three guys in a row who have three emperors in a row with long reigns, this is a good sign. That means there's a lot of stability. And even though there are, you know, there's always going to be conspiracies against the emperors, but if the emperors can thwart those conspiracies and remain on the throne, that stability is important, it's especially considering all the circumstances that have just happened over the, over the course of during, especially during the fifth century. And so the last guy we're going to talk about, I just mentioned his name, was the Emperor Anastasius. Now, Anastasius reigns from 491 to 518. Uh, he was born in Dyrrhachium, which is in e eastern uh, Greece. Today, it's uh, in Albania. And he was from a Greek-speaking family. Uh, you're going to start to see this here uh, basically being the norm pretty soon here. Justinian is going to be the last emperor whose first language was Latin. Uh, uh, so you're going to see, as I mentioned earlier, with uh, Leo being the first emperor to legislate in Greek, you're going to see just more and more uh, uh, you know, the use of the Greek language basically being universal in, in the Eastern Roman Empire. Now, Anastasius does come to the throne later in life. He, he ascends to the throne at age 60. And by this point in time, he is an experienced administrator and a shrewd financier. Um, one does not, part of me wonders if, uh, because Anastasius had to marry into the, 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 the royal family. I want to say he marries um, Ari Ariadne when, when Zeno dies and she's left a widow. I could, I could be mistaken about that but he does marry into the family. And part of me wonders if perhaps uh, people thought, well, he's old, maybe like there was a dispute about who might become the next emperor. And they say, you know, Anastasius is old. He's not going to be around that much longer. Let's just, we'll, we'll put him on the throne. And in a couple of years from now, when he dies, we'll, we'll figure it out then, uh, which is what happened uh, a, a little uh tension here, but that's exactly what happened with uh, Pope Leo the Thirteenth. was that uh, the papal electors could not come to a conclusion or couldn't come, yeah, couldn't come to uh, a decision on, on who they all really wanted to be Pope. And the, at the time, Leo, I, I don't remember what his name was when he was a cardinal, but he was something like 78 years old. And so everyone basically just thought, well, you know, he'll die in a couple of years and hopefully by that point, we'll be able to come to a consensus. Well, it turned out that Leo lived uh, until I think he was 93 years old and all of, he, he basically outlived all of the uh, papal electors uh, who, who elected him. So uh, funny, funny there, but you're right. So we see that uh, Leo here, or sorry, uh, Anastasius here lives, uh, reigns from 491 to 518, so that puts him, he's 60, that's plus 9, 69, plus another, another 10 is 79, so he's living well into his 80s, goodness. Uh, so yes, so yes, he, but yes, he has a lot of experience as an administrator, as a financier, he's good, he's good with money, he's good with administrating, and so, and so he does a lot to improve the uh, revenue stream. He does a lot to trim the fat, cut corruption. He insists that taxes be paid in cash rather than kind as, rather than in kind as much as possible. That's gonna help the Imperial treasury. The more money you have there is good because you can use it to do things like pay soldiers. Uh, Anastasius also gives soldiers an allowance to buy their own weapons and their own armor as opposed to having standard issued uh, uh, equipment by the state, he basically gives the, you know, here's, here's however much money, go buy, you know, the helmet and sword and bow that, you, that is to your liking. And then, it, and then as well, he, he said that if they had money left over that they could keep the extra, which is, 
which is uh, a, a very, very smart decision here to stay on the good side of the soldiers. You always wanna be on the good side of the military for obvious reasons. And Anastasia is really, really a genius here. He managed to increase revenue without increasing taxes. If, if only the United States government could do that these days, really. How, how can we increase revenue while not increasing, and in some cases decreasing taxes? I mean, he removed the tax on something like uh, commerce in urban areas, which was very unpopular. I mean, obviously, you know, people doing business don't want to pay more taxes than they have to. Um, but uh, uh, a lot of the way, you know, the way he saved money was through, um, you know, decrease, fighting corruption, uh, some deregulation, uh, uh, and again, taking more, more transactions in cash rather than in kind. Uh, Anastasius also increases the pay for the soldiers, which increases the number of, recru of Roman recruits, Byzantine recruits into the military. So again, less of a, less of a dependency on Gothic and other barbarian federati and boosting the, uh, uh, the, these soldiers who are citizens of the empire, which is important, which also goes to dispel the idea that, you know, well, well, in the Eastern, in the Western empire, you know, there was, there was an issue with soldiers because of uh, you know, lack of, lack of people or uh, lack of, lack of people who desired to go in, into the military. No, it was, it was a lot of that was due to lack of pay. And so the Western Empire then has to outsource uh, their soldiering. And although there are a number of excellent soldiers who do come from the from the ranks of the barbarians, if you can have, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, for a lot, of, especially for a lot of the Goths, if, the, if Rome falls, well, you know, we weren't really part of Roman society anyways. But for for Romans, if Rome falls, that's a much bigger deal. Okay. Uh, then in 502, just to, just to note here, we're going to see the Bulgars arrive. Now the Bulgars are another uh, in group in the line of these Central Asian nomadic people who show up uh, uh, out of the steppe. Uh, the Bulgars were a Turkic group, uh, probably similar to the Huns, although as, you, as we know, we don't know for sure if the Huns were Turkic or not. You can go back and watch our series on the Huns as well as the Barbarian Invasion Precursor for a whole lot of talk about the origin of the Huns, where the Huns come from, theories about all that. Uh, uh, th those were some really, really fun lectures to give. Definitely recommend you go check them out. Uh, but the Bulgars do arrive. It's not, it's not a huge threat at this point in time, but the, the, uh, the Byzantines are going to have more conflicts with the Bulgars coming up. And obviously, uh, Bulgaria, the country today, is named after the Bulgars. Although, uh, if you go to Bulgaria today, the, the Bulgarian language is Slavic, and more people are Slavic than they are Turkic. But uh, the Bulgars are going to become uh, uh, the, you know, the, the ruling class in that area. So that's where, that's where that comes from. Now, at the same time, in 502, uh, Anastasius is also going to repel an invasion from the Persian Empire. And he assembles 52,000 men to do this, which is about the same amount of men as Julian the Apostate put together for his disastrous campaign against the Persians. Uh, so we can see here that with half the empire, right, Anastasius can only, only has the Eastern empire and Julian had the entire, uh, both East and West at his disposal. And Anastasius can assemble an army just as big to fight the Persians here. So you can see that, uh, you know, not having enough men uh, for the army to put together a competent army the way you, they used to when you had the full, when when you could call on the full Roman Empire. For, this, this is not this is not a real. It's a non sequitur, or I won't even say non sequitur. That might not be the right word, uh, but but it's not valid. It's not it's not a true argument. And one last point to make about uh, and so and Anastasius does. Uh, repel the Persian invasion. Uh, he, do, he manages to push the Persians back some, and he builds a fort uh, somewhere around Dara to kind of dissuade for, uh, the Persian uh, incursions in the future. Persian incursion, uh, that kind of rhymes. Kind of, uh, this sounds like maybe like a, a, some sort of like Middle Eastern like techno group. 
And uh, so my last point here is that Anastasius was a Monophysite Christian. He was not a uh, Catholic Chalcedonian Christian. And uh, because of some of his, uh, because, because he had a lot of success, he thought he could confidently try to push Monophysite uh, Christianity, which ended up not being uh, a very popular. Monophysite Christianity was kind of on the wane by this point in time. And I'll read another, uh, let's see. Yes, one, one last excerpt from uh, Treadgold here. This is on page 61, uh, a, bi a bit of a summary of, of Anastasius's reign. Even after his expensive wars, reduction in taxation, and increase in military pay, Anastasius left his treasury uh, reserve at 23 million nomismata, almost three times the empire's annual budget and more than three times the treasury reserve in 457. Where can we find people like this today? How can we find people who can increase revenue, decrease taxes, and by the time they're done ruling, he increases the, uh, <laughs> the reserves uh, threefold. Yes, please, I would like another one of these. Uh, just without without the heresy. The size of this reserve shows the efficacy of Anastasius's effort to reduce corruption and waste, as well as the uh, pervasiveness pervasiveness of both of them before his reign. Yet such a sum probably also shows the growing prosperity of Byzantium. Like Leo I and Zeno, Anastasius faced stubborn rebel, rebels and powerful invaders, but he defeated them much more easily than his predecessors had done. Under Anastasius, the Eastern Empire seemed healthier than it had ever been before its separate existence. And this, this is I mean, probably true. Um, I have no reason to disagree with the Treadgold here. Um, but anyway, so that is our little lecture here on, on what I'm calling a little interim period between, again, the fall of the West and the rise of Justinian. I hope you all have enjoyed this, this little lecture here. And so please, if you have enjoyed this, leave a thumbs up on the video, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and make sure to hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. Uh, please make sure to also check us out on Apple Podcast and Google Play. And if you are listening on either of those, please give us a follow. And especially if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a five-star review. Uh, I posted recently on both the Instagram and the Facebook. Uh, Instagram now, if you search uh, Prof Run uh, or Professor Run, it should come up. And then the Facebook page, if you look up Professor Run on Facebook, we are also there. Uh, but we recently passed... Uh, 200 views on YouTube, as well as over 100 downloads on the podcast. So that's a total of 300 uh, views and downloads. And as I checked recently, we're, clo we're, we're either close to or we've passed 250 views on, on YouTube, and I haven't checked the podcast numbers in the last few days. But I really do appreciate the support. It's not, it's not huge, but it is something, you know, it, it, baby steps, incremental steps. I'm happy. Yeah. It's, it's just like another goal. You hit 200, you want to get to 300 and then 400 and then 500, a thousand, et cetera. Uh, so thank you so much for, for watching and supporting the show. I really appreciate it. Share it with your, your friends, your family, your coworkers, uh, your, your teachers and professors at school, anyone who you think might be interested in this, please, you know, please share it on your social media pages, share it on your Facebook, your Twitter, your whatever. Uh, I've already plugged our, our Instagram and our Facebook accounts. Check them out. Again, Professor Run on Facebook. And uh, it, you might still have to search academics underscore nine, or yeah, underscore nine five on, on Instagram. It, it, last time I tried to change it, it told me I had to wait a while to change it. I'm not sure exactly why, but uh, that is it for this time. Uh, coming up here, we're going to be getting into the reign of Justinian. Justinian is going to take up several. Uh, uh, episodes on this, but that's okay because he's he's really awesome, and I think probably the most underrated Roman emperor of of the entire Roman history. So that's all I've got for you guys. 
this time, and I'll see y'all next time.